Okay. Mike, you can hear me? Thank you, sir. Stand by. We are getting ready to do introductions, and we will have you live from the audience. Thank you. Great. This is on the internet. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. You all are a fabulous looking audience this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I am delighted to welcome you to today's program, Corruption and Institutional Decay, hosted by the Democracy Initiative's Clear Lab. That's the Corruption Laboratory for Ethics, Accountability, and the Rule of Law or as one of the faculty members said, we're anti-corruption. This is not a how-to. Uh, 
My name is Melody Barnes, and I am the co-director of the Democracy Initiative. And some of you may be familiar with our work, others of you may not. We are a relatively new cross-university program here at the University of Virginia. And our mission is to strengthen and to encourage democratic principles and culture, and that includes a focus on the challenges that face democratic institutions. We do our work through research, teaching, and engagement in public affairs. So that's engagement in a whole range of actors, policymakers, private sector, the public, grassroots leaders, and others, as we focus on these important issues facing our democracy, both at home as well as abroad. The Democracy Initiative's Clear Lab is one of our four rotating interdisciplinary humanities laboratories. And the leadership from that lab includes experts in anthropology, economics, history, law, and politics. And they are people that you will get to know later today, but I want to introduce them briefly. Dan Gingrich, Deborah Hellman, Sandeep Suktankar, Michael Gilbert, David Singerman, and Sylvia Tidy. They bring such great expertise to this topic, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the conversation that you get to have with them later today. They begin their work with this premise, that corruption, and I quote, is the purest and most pernicious form of representational failure that takes place under democracy. It has significant costs that can be quantified, but in addition to that, it undermines faith in public institutions and participation in democracy. And so they focus on essential questions, and we'll be doing that over the period of the next few years, including the causes, methods, and consequences of corruption, and the question, how does corruption propagate itself, and how can it be diminished? We'll start to interrogate some of those questions collectively today. And we have, as you know, fantastic panels for you to enjoy and engage with to do that. We'll start with a conversation between Bill Browder and David Gergen, who I'll introduce in just a few moments. And Mr. Browder will share his experience and his insights with regard to corruption in Russia from direct experience. Please note that if you have questions during that conversation, we'll want you to text them. Those in the room have that information. Please, it's on the small sheet that was in your seat. Um, but I'm going to repeat it for you and for those who are watching online. Text to 530-361-6490. After that, we're going to have a moderated conversation between Phil Kiefer of the Inter-American Development Bank and Cara Brockmeyer, who's a partner at Debevoise and Plimpton, and she was the former chief of the Securities and Exchange Commission's Enforcement Division's Foreign Corrupt Practices Unit. And that conversation is going to be facilitated by UVA's own Vice Provost for Global Affairs, Stephen Mull, who has also had a distinguished career in public service. He was ambassador to Lithuania, to Poland, and he was also the acting Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. And then finally, over lunch, you'll have an opportunity to engage with the lab leaders that I mentioned a few moments ago. And they're going to engage with us on the, over the question, what is a corruption? What is corruption? So now I'm going to introduce Bill Browder and David Gergen. Bill Browder is CEO and co-founder of Hermitage Capital Management Investment Advisor to the Hermitage Fund. They were at one point the largest foreign portfolio investor in Russia. He's also author of Red Notice, A True Story of High Finance, Murder, and One Man's Fight for Justice. And he's one of the chief proponents of the Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act, which punishes Russian human rights uh, violators. And then finally, David Gergen, who we've all seen. If you turn on CNN, you'll know that he's a senior political analyst. At one point, he was editor-at-large at US News and World Report. And he's a former senior advisor to four different presidents, Presidents Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Clinton. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to you, David. Thank you so much.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you, and thank you for your invitation to come again to the UVA campus. It's a special pleasure to be uh, to visit the Miller Center uh, as well during my time here. Um, I come to you from Cambridge, and I, I'm tempted to begin uh, this conversation about corruption with, with blaming you all for stealing, for stealing our Dean of Education at Harvard <laughs> <laughs> and making him your president, you know. <laughs> It was your game, your game, and uh, we celebrate you for that. Um, we have uh, cl clearly a, an important task this morning to help kick off this wonderful project on democracy here at the university. I think you're, you're going to find with the kind of quality of people who are coming here, the resources that may be at hand, uh, that you can quickly build uh, one of the most important uh, centers on democracy in the country. Uh, and there's never been a time, at least I think most of us can remember, when we've needed it more. Uh, so this seems to be entirely appropriate. Um, let's turn to our, our speaker in our opening day and why he's here. Ten years ago to this week, to, ten years ago to this week, a man named Sergei uh, Mazbinsky uh, was found dead in a cell, a prison cell in Moscow, after he'd been tortured, detained for a year, deteriorating health that was not treated, he was really uh, died the worst of all possible deaths. And it was, it was because of corruption. And the, the, his, he was a lawyer, and his client was Bill Browder. Bill Browder was a very successful investment uh, a man who we hope we'll hear more about that. But he launched a crusade to honor his dead lawyer and to expose the corruption that he found in Russia. That he awakened in the 10 years since, he awakened the world to the dangers posed to democracy by, by corruption in countries around the world. <clears throat> his book, which I commend to you, it's a wonderful book, called Red Notice, sold over 350,000 copies. 350,000 copies. Most of us who come out of the academic side of the world, we're just like, what? You know, how do all the zeros get in there? The, uh, uh, but but in any event, he had a, it's an electrifying tale. I commend it to you. I think you would find it just, it's a terrific read, but more importantly, it helps to expose, and it brings to light the, the, the documents. This is the most well-documented uh, human rights abuse anywhere in the world, or especially in Russia. It's come out of Russia in the last four decades or so. It is an important story, and it has, what we'll talk about is Bill Browder's journey, then ask him to assess where we are in terms of corruption, and then we want to, toward the end, we want to come back to one of the elephants in the room, and that is the question of the relationship of the United States uh, leadership to the Russian leadership today and how to think about that. So, Bill Browder, thank you, sir, for not only joining us today, but thank you more importantly for the crusade you've been on. It, it, you've been, you, you've had a lot of reasons to worry about your own security over the years, but you've persevered, uh, and the world is different. It's a better place because of you. So thank you. We'd love to hear more of your story. Tell us, tell us, so everyone is brought up to speed. Um, sure. Well, for, first of all, um, uh, thank, thank, uh, thank you, everybody in the audience, for coming to hear me and David and the others instead of watching the impeachment. Uh, <laughs> as, a, as, in, as a specialist uh, unit on corruption, um, they're both uh, sort of equal draws. Um, um, and I'm very honored um, that uh, UVA has uh, chosen me and David to uh, have this conversation at the beginning of the Clear Lab um, initiative, and and, uh, and I'm very honored to be on the same stage as David, who's a legend in the in the world of policy and politics. Um, so let me just, in in a very uh, short um, snip, tell you my story and, and the story of the Magnitsky Act, so you have the context, so we can then get into a, a broader discussion. Uh, uh, I, I have a strange background. Um, I come from a family of American communists. My grandfather was the leader of the Communist Party of America. Um, when I was going through my uh, teenage rebellion, I was trying to figure out the best way of, of rebelling against a family of communists, and I figured it out, which was to put on a suit and tie and to become a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I ended up um, going to Stanford Business School and I graduated business school in 1989, which was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And as I was trying to figure out what, what type of career to have after business school, um, one day I had an epiphany, which is that if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America um, and the Berlin Wall has just come down, I'm gonna to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And that's what I set out to do. Uh, I first moved to London and then I eventually moved to Moscow and I set up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund, which um, grew from zero to becoming the largest um, foreign investment fund in the country with more than four and a half billion dollars invested in the Russian stock market. And one of the things I discovered in my um, journey was that all the companies that I was investing in in Russia were basically nonprofit companies. And when I say nonprofit companies, I don't mean they were nonprofit because they were uh, donating money to um, orphans or uh, supporting sick people. They were nonprofit because all the money that they were earning was being stolen out of the back door by corrupt oligarchs and corrupt government officials. And um, in a country like Russia, where, there, um, where the institutions um, didn't work, you couldn't go to the police and say, there's terrible corruption going on in this company I'm investing in, please investigate it, because they were more or less part of it. And you couldn't go to the parliament and say, um, you know, can you do something because the parliament was basically part of it and couldn't go to the regulators. And so the only, the only tools that I really had to um, deal with this was to research the corruption. Um, I, I and my team of analysts were really good at doing research and we could research how they did the corruption. And then the other tool that I had was that I was friends with and, and associated with lots of journalists um, in Moscow who I got to know over the years. And so we'd share our research with the journalists. And um, we started conducting what I call naming and shaming campaigns in, in big Russian companies. And it was an interesting uh, uh, way of going about things. And, and at the time that I started, um, which was around 1999, was the year that Vladimir Putin had just come to power. and. Vladimir Putin was a prime minister in 1999. He became president uh, in year 2000. And he was kind of suffering in, in a strange way, in the same way I was suffering. The oligarchs were stealing money from me at the same time as they were stealing power from him. And so um, it, it was, it, it, and there's this expression, uh, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And in the sort of Byzantine medieval world of Russia at the time, um, that was very true. And so I've never met Vladimir Putin uh, then or, or since then, or ever had a conversation with him. But every time that I would, I would put out one of these naming and shaming exposés about the oligarchs, um, Putin would step in and he would um, uh, do something. He would fire somebody, he would issue a presidential decree, he would um, change the law, um, he would vote the government's shares. And as a result of that, um, for about four years, I had this incredible run where every scandal I would put out there would get quickly shut down because of this strange support from Vladimir Putin. Um, the problem was uh, that Vladimir Putin wasn't really interested in, in um, cleaning up Russia. Um, he just didn't want the oligarchs to have all this power. And he just finally decided to go for broke in 2003 when he arrested the richest oligarch in Russia a man named Mikhail Hordakovsky, who was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. He arrested him, he put him on trial, and he allowed the television cameras to come into the courtroom and film the richest man in Russia on trial, sitting in a cage. And if you were another Russian oligarch and you saw this going on, um, your natural reaction would be that you didn't want to sit in that cage. And so one by one by one, the rest of the oligarchs went to Putin and said, what do we have to do to make sure we don't sit in that cage? And he said, real simple, 50%. And not 50% for the Russian government or 50% for the presidential administration of Russia, 50% for Vladimir Putin. And at that moment in time, um, Putin became the biggest oligarch in Russia. And he became one of the richest, if not the richest man in the world. And, and unfortunately for me, I wasn't reading the tea leaves. I just kept on naming and shaming oligarchs. But instead of naming and shaming Putin's enemies, I was now naming and shaming Putin's personal 50% financial interest. 
And in November of 2005, as I was flying back to Russia from a weekend trip to London, I was stopped at the border. I was detained for 15 hours. And then I was um, deported from Russia and declared a threat to national security. Now, when Russia turns on you, they don't tend to do so mildly. They tend to do so with extreme prejudice. And I understood that there was a lot of other things they could do, which would be worse than deporting me. And so I evacuated my entire staff and their dependents from Russia. And we quickly and quietly liquidated our entire portfolio and successfully got our people out safely and got our assets out of Russia safely. And I thought that was the end of the story. And it turns out it wasn't. About 18 months after I was kicked out, um, 25 police officers raided my empty Moscow office. There was only one secretary there. And 25 more officers raided the office of an American law firm that I used. And they went there to seize all the corporate documents for our empty investment holding companies that they didn't know were empty. And um, they seized the documents. And the next thing we know, we no longer own our investment companies. The documents that have been seized by the police have been used to fraudulently steal our companies through effectively identity theft. At this point, I was terrified, not because we had any economic exposure, our money was safe, but I was terrified that if the police were using raiding offices to steal documents, God knows what else they would do. And one day I'd be traveling through some airport somewhere and be arrested on a Russian warrant. And so I went out and hired the smartest lawyer I knew in Russia, a young man named Sergei Magnitsky, to investigate. Sergei went out and investigated, and he came back and, and he said, I figured out what this is all about. He said, there were two, two parts of the scam. The first part was they wanted to steal all of your money, but they didn't succeed because all of your money was out of the country by the time they, they did this raid. He said, however, the second part they did succeed in. And the second part was, was highly cynical. And what happened was that after I had taken all of my money, all of the, firm, the fund's money out of Russia, um, we had a, a huge profit. We declared a profit of a billion dollars, and we paid to the Russian government $230 million of capital gains tax. And what Sergei had figured out was that the people who had stolen our companies had gone to the tax authorities, and they said there was a mistake made in the previous year's tax filing. And they came up with a, a complicated explanation for why these companies hadn't actually earned a billion dollars. And they filed an amended tax return saying that the companies earned zero and therefore, they should get all of the $230 million of taxes that we paid um, refunded to them. They applied for it on the 23rd of December, 2007. And the tax refund request was approved and paid out the next day. <laughs> it was the largest tax refund in the history of Russia paid out in one day on a fraud. Now, Sergey and I were, were thinking to ourselves that Putin is a, a, is a nationalist. He's a patriot. And if he knew that, then this wasn't our money that was being stolen. This was the Russian government's money that was being stolen. And so if he knew that, he would crack down on these people stealing the Russian government's money, and that would be the end of the story. And so we wrote criminal complaints to every different branch of Russian law enforcement. I went to the media, and Sergei gave sworn testimony at the Russian State Investigative Committee in order to um, uh, 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 name the people involved. Um, Five weeks after he testified, the same people he testified against came to his home on the 24th of November, 2008. They arrested him. They put him in pretrial detention. And then he was tortured in pretrial detention to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat in December in Moscow, so he nearly <clears throat> froze to death. They put him in cells with no, uh, uh, no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. And they wanted to get him to withdraw his testimony. And for him, the idea of withdrawing his testimony and perjuring himself was, was, uh, uh, was worse than the physical pain they were subjecting him to, and he refused. He ended up getting very sick from more torture and more mistreatment. Um, he developed pancreatitis and gallstones and lost 40 pounds. They refused him all medical attention after that. And on the night of November 16, 2009, he went into critical condition. And on that night, um, the, uh, the authorities, instead of putting him in an emergency room, uh, they put him in an isolation cell. They chained him to a bed. 
and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat Sergei Magnitsky until he died. He was 37 years old. Um, that was 10 years ago, um, 10 years ago, and, and uh, as 10 years ago last Saturday. And I, I, I made a vow after uh, his death uh, to put aside all of my other activities, to put aside my business, and to use all of my time, all of my resources, and all of my energies to going after the people who killed him and uh, make sure they face justice. And we never got any justice in Russia because Putin circled the wagons and exonerated everybody personally. And so I went to Washington and I went to a Democratic Senator from Maryland named Benjamin Cardin and Republican Senator from Arizona, John McCain. And I shared with them the story I've just shared with you today. And I said, can we freeze the assets and ban the visas of the people who did this? And that became known as the Magnitsky Act. And it didn't just go after Sergei Magnitsky's killers, it went after all Russian human rights violators. And in a, in a, uh, a town where people just about can't agree on anything in Washington, this is the one thing they could agree on. And it went for a vote in November of 2012 and it passed the Senate 92 to four. It passed the House of Representatives with 89% and it became a federal law on December 14th, 2012. And, um, Vladimir Putin went out of his mind when the Magnitsky Act was passed because Vladimir Putin is a Russian, uh, he's a human rights violator, and he has a lot of money offshore, and he's ready to kill for money, um, and therefore he values money more than human life. And so to put his own money at risk uh, made him go crazy. He banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. He uh, made repealing the Magnitsky Act his single largest foreign policy priority, and he even sent a lawyer named Natalia Veselnitskaya the Trump Tower when before Trump was elected to meet with Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort on June 9th, 2016, with one, one ask, that if Donald Trump was elected, could he repeal the Magnitsky Act? I'm, I'm happy to say it hasn't happened. And we now have Magnitsky Acts in the United States, um, in Canada, in the UK, in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and hopefully soon to be in the EU. And so I think, um, I guess that concludes my introductory remarks and David, perhaps you have some questions or thoughts. Thank you, Bill. That was, that was a riveting story and, and for, for which uh, you, your last 10 years of your life devoted to this cause, uh, absolutely remarkable, but I think it's given hope in many other countries. It uh, shows what, what an individual sometimes can do. Um, I, I wanted to give people a little bit more of a sense of the, uh, 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 the realities you were facing. It's not just Sergei who is, uh, was tortured and killed. There have been others that yeah. the Russians have come after. Yeah. And have they been subjected to various forms of torture? Well, so let, let, let's, let's go through the list. So yeah. um, one of the people who was most effective in um, helping me get the Magnitsky Act passed um, was a Russian opposition politician named Boris Nemtsov. Right. Boris Nemtsov was the, for, was the former deputy prime minister of Russia. He broke with the Russian regime, the Putin regime, and became one of the most outspoken opposition politicians. And he went to the US Congress, to the Canadian Parliament, to the European Parliament, to the British Parliament, with the message that the Magnitsky Act was not anti-Russian legislation, it was pro-Russian legislation, because um, uh, it was basically targeting individuals who were stealing from the Russian people. And um, uh, he was gunned down and shot and killed um, in February of 2015. Uh, he, he has a uh, uh, protege. Uh, he had a protege named uh, Vladimir Karamurza. Vladimir Karamurza uh, was a young democracy activist who was w following Boris in his footsteps. Um, he's in his mid thirties. He then started to travel with me all over the world to continue to lobby for the Magnitsky Acts. And uh, he was then in Russia um, in, I think this was 2015, 2000, I think 2016, and, um, and he was poisoned. And he was poisoned so badly he went into a coma, multiple organ failure, doctors gave him a 5% chance of living. And remarkably and amazingly, he somehow was able to recover from that. He was then poisoned again the following year. He's been poisoned twice for his activities uh, supporting the Magnitsky Act. The uh, lawyer for Sergei Magnitsky's uh, mother, who's been active um, in fighting for justice, uh, was thrown off a, a four-story apartment building uh, in Moscow. 
one of the whistleblowers, um, a man named Alexander Perpolichny, uh, who came to us. He was actually a member of the criminal group. He came to us after Sergei was murdered with information on all of their financial activities that we used to open up criminal cases against the uh, criminal group. Um, he dropped dead at the age of 44 in a suburb of London um, in 2012. And, um, and then I myself have been subjected to um, uh, death threats, kidnapping threats. Um, uh, the Russian government has issued eight Interpol arrest warrants to try to get me back to Russia. I've been sentenced in absentia to 18 years in Russian prison. Um, I've been accused of, of uh, serial murder, of espionage, of fraud, tax evasion, and many other crimes. Uh, they rush, I live in London and the Russians have come to the British government on a dozen different occasions asking for extradition and mutual legal assistance. I was arrested in Madrid last year on a Russian Interpol warrant. Um, I'm probably one of their, at this point, their number one targets uh, because of the work that I've done with the Magnitsky Act. And so uh, everybody involved in this story has paid a very dear price. And, um, and the fact that they're so crazy about it shows you how effective this law and this policy it really is. <clears throat> there were two numbers uh, that you've talked about in the past that really sort of blew me away when I f first encountered them. One was how many people are working for Putin as a f they're officials in the government, but they re report to him and they're sort of a goon squad, a huge goon squad. You said 10,000? 10, 10,000 well, officials? There, there, there's a couple of interesting numbers. So um, let me just throw out some numbers. First of yeah. all, let me, let's start with Putin's net worth before I get his goon squad. So I believe Putin is worth $200 billion. Right. Uh, I, I believe that- 200 billion he's taken from the country. That's, that's stolen money. Stolen money. He, I mean, he, he hasn't started a technology company or something great like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, I believe the people around him, and I would classify this as, as about a thousand people- um, oh, a thousand, stolen. okay. Uh, have stolen a trillion dollars. So if we, it's Putin and the, and the thousand people around him have stolen a trillion dollars since he started working. He only this. got 20 percent? He got, only got 20 percent. That's sort of the 80-20 uh, okay. rule. Um, the, um, uh, there are 10,000 people around him that are sort of doing the, um, the sort of corruption like what happened uh, with uh, Sergei Magnitsky, you know, yeah. with the, the, people, the, the people who are arresting Sergei Magnitsky, the right. people the, the prosecutors, the judges, the, the um, bailiffs, the, all the uh, people all involved in that thing, 10,000 people. But here's the most remarkable statistic, and I, and I think that nobody will guess this. So um, Vladimir Putin is absolutely terrified of what happened um, to Yanukovych, the, the president of Ukraine. In, in Ukraine, uh, this, he was a corrupt president, um, and people started getting angry when he started uh, selling out his people to Russia over Europe. And, and 5,000 people went to the uh, Maidan Square, which is their central square. And then uh, 10,000 people came out, then 20,000, then 50,000, then 100,000, then 500,000. And pretty soon he was so scared that he got on a Russian helicopter and ran for his life. And Putin has this image in his mind of what happened to Yanukovych. He has an image of what happened to Gaddafi in, in uh, Libya. And he's just terrified because he knows that if things spin out of control, that can happen to him. And there is no Russia, you know, the, the president of Ukraine went to Russia, but there is no comparable safe haven for Vladimir Putin. Uh, he has no place to go. And so he's terrified of, of that happening to him. And so he set up a special um, presidential guard. And, and when I, it's interesting, if I, 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 it's kind of hard for me to like uh, ask people to raise their hand and say how many people you think or his presidential guard because I'm sitting here on, uh, talking on the screen. But when I do this with in, in person, you know, I say, how many people think that, that he's got like uh, a thousand people as presidential presidential guard? A few hands will go up, and I say like two thousand. More hands will go up, five thousand. Um, Vladimir Putin has in his presidential guard five hundred thousand people. Whoa, <laughs> five hundred thousand. Where are they? Who who? He, he, <laughs> what do they do? He's basically picked the most elite people in the country um, in all different fields to protect him. And so what that means is that he, he, he essentially has his own army. And so the, it, 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 of, of highly elite people, the best, who are ready to fire on their own citizens if something were to happen because he's so paranoid about it. So if there, were, if there were a coup attempt, 
He could, he could call upon 500,000 people to defend not him coup, and his enemies. Not just a coup attempt. It could also be a, a, um, a revolution or an uprising. Right. Because that's what he's most afraid of. Right. And, and um, that gives you some sense of the psychology of Vladimir Putin. He's both um, highly paranoid and very, very foresightful and careful. And he wants to stay in power until he breathes his last breath. Yeah. He's not going to leave power in, in a democratic way. He's not going to leave power at the end of the constitutional limits. He's going to stay there forever. So I, I assume this 500, guard, these 500,000 guards also uh, mean that his authoritarian, dictatorial uh, grip on the country has, has, has tightened a lot since he, was, he first came to power in 2000, was it? So, but it been, with this long-term plan in mind, uh, he's he's building. A, he he's tightening and tightening and tightening. So, so, so basically, he's got to stay in power forever because of several things. So, coming back, so the original sin is the money. He's right. stolen a lot of money, and that money and the money around, of the people around him, the trillion dollars, should have gone to paying for people's health right. care, uh, right. for education, for roads. And so the you know life expectancy in Russia is like remarkably low because when you go to if you're if you're sort of a late middle aged man and you go to the doctor and you you want blood pressure pills they don't have them you know if you need a, a sort of heart surgery or you know kidney dialysis it doesn't happen you just die and so people are dying young people are having a, can't be educated there's just hopelessness in the country and that's because all the money has been taken out of the country and and. Because of that, Putin is, a, and, and he's got a supposed democracy there. I mean, so people kind of think that they can vote for the, the president of the country. This is not a, 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 a royalty, uh, you know, this is not, there, there's a royal family. This is a democracy. Everyone's supposed to be elected to be, you know, in power. And so people kind of think that they can choose their president. And so he can, he can manipulate this stuff pretty well. He can eliminate all competition he can put in he can kill like he did with Boris Nemtsov he can imprison like he's done with uh, another man named Alexei Navalny he can exile like he's done with Garry Kasparov but at the end of the day there's going to be an election and he can even cheat in the election which he does but at some point if the cheating becomes so outrageous people people won't won't accept that and so and at the same time if everybody's poor and he's rich and the other 1000 people are rich that doesn't work in a democracy and so He's got to come up with sort of a way of, of dealing with this, this um, seething anger. And so what does he do? He starts wars. He started a war in Ukraine. The Russians have nothing. There, there's no beef they have with the Ukrainians. It was totally a manufactured war. It was a complete uh, propaganda created war in order for him to, to, to distract the attention away from him towards a foreign enemy. And, and then when, when that war was sort of losing its, its popular appeal, they started going after the, the Syria. They started doing these bombing runs in Syria. And he's got to constantly be faced with a foreign enemy that he's uh, defeating in order for him to keep the Russian people at bay on one hand. And on the other hand, he also has to completely turn the screws on anybody inside the country who might be grumbling and challenging him. Right. And so people are being uh, uh, arrested all over the place who have any kind of opposition to Vladimir Putin. And so as time goes on, more foreign adventures are gonna happen and more repression inside the country is gonna happen in order for Vladimir Putin to stay in power. Because he understands that if he doesn't stay in power, he loses all his money, um, he probably goes to jail and he, and he might even die. And mm. so for him, it's an existential threat. Right. Where does he put that money? How, where, how can he save? He sends the money to the West, but how can he protect it? Well, this is a very good question. So he doesn't keep any money in his own name because if he kept it in his own name, then somebody who had the access to those documents could use them to blackmail him. And so all the money is in the name of trustees, oligarch trustees. Some of you may remember um, the, the Panama Papers came out in 2016, right. and every country had a had a hero in these Panama Papers. And the hero in Russia was a very obscure um, cellist, a musician um, named Sergei Roldugin. 
And Raul Dugan um, was an owner of a network of companies that had accumulated $2 billion um, from oligarchs and Russian state banks. And everyone is sort of scratching their heads saying, well, why is this cellist got We, we've lost, uh, hold on, we, we went into a frozen state. <laughs> Hello? Hello? It just came back on. Well, hold on. Are you back, Bill? Hello? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Good, good. We lost you for, for a moment. But we're glad okay. you're back. So let me let me ask you this: the, there there is a sense, and I, I well, I think there's a belief that corruption is growing in a number of countries, um, that and it's it's growing in actually in a number of democratic countries, countries once considered democratic. <laughs> are there other sort of are there people out there? How, how do you how do you see the uh, the corruption threat around the world, and are there other minor Putins starting to pop up in places? Are there are there authoritarian rulers who are taking their clues from and their and their and their playbook out of, from Putin? Well, I, I think a lot of them are. So, um, uh, you know, sort of working our way away from Russia. So you have the um, Erdogan in Turkey um, is has completely gone off the deep end, uh, total dictator. Um, uh, then you've got um, and cr crooked, and then you've got Orban, uh, Victor Orban, the um, uh, Prime Minister of Hungary, um, same thing. Um, you've got uh, Duterte in the Philippines. Um, you've got um, uh, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil. Um, and, and it seems to be a, a growing trend. They, they, uh, there's a name for it, the illiberal international. Right. Um, where, where these guys are sort of, uh, sort of uh, klepto dictatorships. And um, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any consequence at the moment for these people. And one of the reasons why the Magnitsky Act is, is, is also at the same time become so popular as a policy tool is that um, it's a way of dealing with this type of, of uh, yeah. corruption and uh, human rights abusers. Yeah, you said, you, that, yeah, sorry. But, but there are about a half dozen countries now that have uh, embraced the Magnitsky Act. So there's six countries that have it, and, and, and my hope and my plan, and, and I think I'm going to succeed, is that this thing is going to roll out so it's going to be ubiquitous across uh, civilized countries and, and a tool that can be used quite widely. And, and what, do you, used. what do you think an agenda for a university might be in trying to understand uh, this by, at UVA here as they're launching their uh, democracy initiative? Well, the... the um, uh, the, the first thing that everybody needs to understand is is how um, uh, how destructive uh, corruption really is. And so, uh, I mean, I, I live in London, and London is really a, a, a major sort of hub of dirty money. I mean, they, they launder the money of all these people, and and it, and it frustrates me to no end that members of the establishment here are sort of um, oblivious and uh, enabling this kind of corruption and are not sensitized to the, um, you know, that, that, that it's not just money, it's blood money and people mm -hmm. have died over this money. And mm -hmm. so it's really important, I think, as a first step to understand the, the human cost of the corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the Magnitsky story is so important. Um, and then in understanding that, then, then sort of understanding what, what can be done about it. And there's a lot of, there's, you know, the Magnitsky Act is one of the tools. There's many other tools as well. I understand that when the subsequent speaker comes from the uh, SEC and, and has dealt with Foreign Corrupt Practice Act um, uh, prosecutions. And so there, that's another tool. Um, there's money laundering regulations and tools. And, and I think that there's, I, I mean, I don't, I, 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 it's kind of an unfair fight at this moment in time, but I think as time goes on and as technology improves, and as information improves, it's going to become a more even fight between the forces of good and the forces of evil using a lot of these tools because um, it's not going to be so hard to figure out who's doing the bad stuff. Yeah, there, there, there is an argument uh, in, in, among, in the journals about um, yeah, the question of whistleblower laws and whether they, in fact, uh, provide an additional form of uh, anti-corruption. Well, I, 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 um, uh, the answer is that, that whistleblowers... Um, are, are not protected um, 
and Sergei Magnitsky was a whistleblower. We saw what happened to him, and 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 um, th there's really it's it's a very thankless task mm -hmm. and job to be a whistleblower. Right. Um, and 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 there really shouldn't have to be whistleblowers. I mean, it's it's interesting um, uh, how this works, and so. Right now, in order for us to prosecute money laundering connected to the Magnitsky case, and that's been another part of our our whole um, justice campaign, it's taken 10 years and it's required certain whistleblowers to come forward, like that guy, Alexander Perpolichny, who I told you about, who dropped dead in London. Um, but it shouldn't have taken 10 years and it shouldn't have required a whistleblower. In theory, um, all this financial information um, is flowing, uh, is, is, is sort of it exists and technology uh, you know in the old days if we wanted to like do a research project we uh, you know when i was in college you would go to the library and, and you go to the book you go to the librarian of the college library and you'd ask for like this book and that book and then you'd have to go to the book stacks and get the book and then you could look up a passage now now you can just go to google and it takes like five minutes and the same thing and so we're, we're sort of in this old world of, of money laundering investigations which require going to like the book stacks, the equivalent of going to the book stacks in terms of connecting all the dots and so on. But that shouldn't be, shouldn't have to happen. And I think that that as technology improves, as information is more widely shared between law enforcement, government, and so on, uh, a lot of this stuff should should uh, evaporate just because of that. Mm -hmm. that, that we have questions from the floor, but I, I want to pursue one last area uh, for a, a few moments. And that is the question of the relationship between the current U.S. leadership and the Russian leadership. You know, the, the, the president would argue that he, and he argues that he's been the toughest on Russia of any recent president. Um, and he helped Ukraine, he got the javelins in there, uh, and, 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 and the previous administration was sending blankets. Um, and, and so there are a variety of arguments, and when Putin seemed to make a play to get the U.S. to try to send you to Moscow, uh, I think it was in Helsinki in that yeah. conversation that the president basically said no at the end of the day. So they say they've been really tough, but there are a lot of other folks who see it just the opposite. I'm curious what you, how you read that relationship. I know part of it would have to be speculative. Well, so so it's it, so here here's the thing. So at, at the Helsinki summit with Putin in in July of 2018. It was the Monday after the Friday that um, uh, Robert Mueller indicted the 12 <laughs> Russian GRU officers. And so a journalist asked Putin at the summit on the Monday, are you going to hand over the GRU officers? And um, uh, Putin said, well, it's not so simple as that. Uh, we, we may very well, as long as Donald Trump hands over Bill Browder and 11 American government officials that are part of his criminal enterprise. Right. And, and then they went to Trump and they said, what do you think about that? And Trump said, I think it's a great idea, <laughs> and 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 it required a vote, a, a Senate vote, um, which was four days later, in which the Senate was going to vote 98 to zero, that that um, Trump walked it back. And so, obviously, um, he was easy on Russia in that ridiculous request, mm -hmm. and he's also been easy on Russia in a lot of public statements where he said he's tweeted out saying, "I don't think Putin's a killer. Um, why, can't, you know, Russia should be a member of the G." Eight, um, NATO, you know, is 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 not a good organization, and all sorts of things that, that Putin likes. That's on one hand. On the other hand, um, it's absolutely correct that that um, the United States under Trump provided offensive weapons to Ukraine. Um, the United States uh, has been uh, robust during the Trump administration in sanctioning people on the Magnitsky list. Um, uh, the United States ha has has taken a number of, of steps. The, the, the United States sanctioned seven of the richest Russian oligarchs um, after the election hacking, which was in the, and sanctioning rich oligarchs is probably one of the most devastating things that can be done. And so, it's kind of a weird uh, schizophrenia. Um, and so, I don't think it, it's. I mean, so I, I can t I can say with great certainty that that. The U.S. government, for the most part, the Trump administration, the people who are uh, acting out his, uh, the sort of duties of government, have been clear-eyed and hawkish and proper, appropriately tough on Russia. And then you got Donald Trump himself with these strange sentiments that you see expressed on Twitter. H how all this stuff interacts and who's making the decisions, I don't know. And so it's impossible for me to to really make a judgment about 
what's going on, but but the fact that 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 I, he thought it was a brilliant idea to hand me over for four days, you know, leads me to a, to not a great conclusion about what's going on in his own. <laughs> do, do you think you would have escaped alive if he had sent you? No, I, I, if I had been sent to Russia, I would be dead. No, no question about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, let's come to a couple of questions from the uh, from the uh, the, f the floor. Uh, here's someone who says, in the future, I hope we will be applying Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act to the Crown Prince Solomon of Saudi Arabia. Your thoughts? So um, uh, the, 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 mur the murder, um, the dismemberment, the, the mutilation of Jamal Khashoggi is one of the most horrific crimes that uh, I've ever heard of. And the Magnitsky Act is the absolute perfect policy tool for getting justice in that crime. And uh, I say so because the Magnitsky Act is about truth tellers, about people who, who, um, who have gone against governments, who have been uh, extrajudicially killed. And, and it's, just, it's the absolute perfect um, tool for, 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 for that case. And in fact, I wrote a Time Magazine article right after it happened that they uh, put on the put, put in Time Magazine, calling for the Magnitsky Act to be applied, and many other people in Washington, on both sides of the aisle, demanded the Magnitsky Act be applied, and it ended up getting applied to 17 Saudis, the ones who were, right. um, you know, doing the in, doing the dirty work, but it didn't apply to Mohammed bin Salman, who, according to most um, analysis and and intelligence and evidence. Um, directed this crime and and um, uh, and was well aware of it in advance and afterwards, and um, uh, he's been protected by Donald Trump up until now. And and in fact, um, uh, the um, uh, Senate called on on the government to sanction him, and uh, and that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so I, this 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 file is not closed. The, the, um, everybody who knows about this story. Um, is to this day uh, is absolutely enraged, disgusted, and alarmed right. by it, and um, uh, and and you know th this will this this campaign for justice for Jamal Khashoggi will carry on until until um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is is sanctioned. How, another question here is: How do you read uh, the threat of Russian meddling in U.S. elections, especially in the upcoming 2020 presidential election? Well, so Vladimir Putin is—he's um, very predictable character. He's, he's almost childlike in the way he does things, and he tends to do things unless there's a boundary put around him to not do things. And um, and there's been certain boundaries put around him. There's a boundary put up so he doesn't invade the Baltic states by sending put, by putting NATO troops there, and and um, there's boundary put in place um, about sports doping that they couldn't participate in the Olympics that so they had to like try to not cheat, which sort mm -hmm. of worked and sort of didn't. But um, there has not been any boundary put up in the United States to prevent the um, uh, meddling in the next election. The fact that um, uh, the U.S. that the Trump administration has been so resistant to any type of, of acknowledgement. Um, that there was a problem means that there will be a, a new problem in, in, in 2020. And Putin loves meddling in elections with, uh, because it's all plausibly deniable and it's hard to measure and it's hard to prove. And that, that's his best place to operate is sort of in the shadows. And so I'm 100% sure that he will meddle um, and he'll look for all sorts of opportunities. And, and, uh, um, and at the moment, there's nothing, there's, there's no barriers that have been set up to stop him. Is, is it possible he could actually change the results of the election? Well, it depends. It de I mean, so he can't create the conditions that people feel on the ground and in their hearts. Right. All he can do is 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 um, work get people worked up, um, people who have certain beliefs or people who are sitting on the fence and getting the, sort of you know changing a few a few minds here or there. And so it all depends on how close something is and, and where it is and. and yeah. um, and you know, so it's um, you know the, the um, 2016 election was was good because you know in a few states it was absolutely razor thin margins, and so in theory and, and in practice he 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 could and he did change the minds of a few people. 
Mm -hmm. uh, another question from the floor, uh, and that is about what percentage of the stolen money um, has been frozen through the Magnitsky acts? Do you have any sense well, of that? Well, so, so there, there are several things going on. So the Magnitsky Act um, hasn't frozen any money that I'm aware of in the United States. However, um, we have frozen um, through criminal investigations about 40 million of the 230 million in, in the United States, in France, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Monaco, Holland, um, and Lithuania. Um, uh, however, and, and this is where the Magnitsky Act gets very interesting, is the power of it is not so much in freezing the assets, although that is powerful if they have assets. The power of it is that when you get added to the Magnitsky list, you get put on something called the OFAC sanctions list. And when you get added to the OFAC sanctions list, the moment that your, your name is put on the OFAC sanctions list, every bank in the world has a, uh, a database that they, they subscribe to called WorldCheck or something like it which looks for people being sanctioned. And then they cross-reference that with their account list. And the moment that, that you're put on world check and you're on the sanctions list, no bank anywhere in the world wants to do business with you anymore because no bank wants to be in violation of US Treasury sanctions. Because if you are in violation, then you'll be fined three times the amount of money that you've done business on by the US Treasury. And so let's say that somebody has $100 million in your bank. Um, and, and um, they're put on the sanctions list, and then they asked for that money to be transferred out, um, that bank could pay a $300 million fine to the US Treasury. And so what happens when you get added to the Magnitsky list is you become effectively a international financial pariah. Nobody will touch you after that. You can mm -hmm. no longer do business anywhere in the world. And that's the real power of the Magnitsky Act. Mm -hmm. um Another question from uh, these are sort of how, how do things work? How does Putin maintain control over 500,000 uh, presidential guards? Is this a, are they a formal part of the Russian military? And why is it in their interest to be loyal to him? Well, so uh, the way it works is that he gives special privileges to the people who are most loyal to him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he, he controls people in all aspects of society with a carrot and a stick. The carrot for these people would be um, uh, extra money, um, more privileges, and generally a better life. And the stick um, is what happened to Sergei Skripal in Salisbury, England, where um, uh, he was a, a disloyal traitor in Putin's mind. And so, and the message was that it doesn't matter when you were disloyal, how you're disloyal, or where you're disloyal, we're going to track you down anywhere in the world and we're going to uh, poison you in the most horrible way. Um, and so the carrot and the stick work pretty well in Russia. Mm -hmm. But again, is, is, are the 500,000 part of the military or are we looking at something like what goes on in Iran you know, with the Revolutionary Guard? Well, it's called the Presidential Guard. And so I would imagine yeah. that, that some, some people are, are, are sort of elite policemen that belong to the Presidential Guard. Some of them are, are soldiers. Some of them are uh, mm -hmm. intelligence officers. Um, he's basically picked the elite people out of all the different um, organizations and grouped them under this presidential guard, this sort of uh -huh. Victorian guard. This is an interesting question from a, a student. If you were starting your career over today, what would you pursue? <laughs> <laughs> well, people ask me, you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, knowing now what I knew, knowing, you know, knowing then what I know now, um, what would I do differently? And I always say, I wouldn't have gone to Russia. Uh, <laughs> I would so, have stayed in California, and I could have had a nice life in Silicon Valley or, or whatever. Um, uh, uh, I mean, well, I mean, what, what would I produce, pursue now? I'm pursuing what I what I what I love doing right now, which is um, human rights work. It's it's very gratifying. Fighting for justice is uh, immensely satisfying, much more than fighting for money. Um, but I wouldn't be able to fight for justice as effectively if I didn't have money. And so right. it's not right for me to say that I wouldn't well, try did, to make money. Did you get anything? Have you gotten any money back from that being defrauded way back when? Well, the, 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 um, the thing was that they didn't defraud me. They defrauded the Russian government of taxes that I paid. We got all of our money out safely. And so my money wasn't stolen. And so I'm, I'm sort of whole from the experience. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, so, we're, so. We're, we're nearly out of time. I would I'd love to have closing thoughts that you might have for this group as they 
pursue these questions about democracy and corruption? Well, I, I guess the, the, the thing I would say is, is that um, uh, my, my story, um, you know, if you, if you have a chance to read my book, and probably a few of you have, and a lot of you haven't, um, they should, I think it should be assigned reading, certainly in any, any um, uh, course on corruption or program on corruption, because everybody who reads my book you know, sort of says, you know, I kind of knew it was bad, but I never knew it was that bad. Mm. And, 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 and the, the reason why that's important is that, that um, and it's really easy, easy to read, but the, re the reason that, that it's important is that um, uh, is it, getting into the sort of granularity of, of the badness that people need to understand. You can't just sort of put a head heading on it. And when you understand the, the, the in granular terms how bad it is and, and the human cost of that, it really does make you feel much more sort of robust about um, about doing something about this. And so um, I'm glad you gave me an hour to hear hear me out. And, and I hope that um, I've left you with something to think about. And, and um, again, honored to be part of this um, of this exercise and this program. And Red Notice. That's the name of the book. Uh, you can find it easily. Bill Brown. Thank you. Thank you very much.